always thrive when they're able to isolate their victims and when they're able to control all the information related to their actions. Case in point, the differing conclusions of Ruby Ridge, Waco, and the Bundy Ranch. Ruby Ridge, what happened? A man named Randy Weaver was accused of selling shotguns that were, per the dictates of some self-proclaimed rulers, too short, a quarter inch too short to be specific. After Weaver refused to work with the ATF as an informant, he was threatened in legal land with weapons charges. He was mailed the incorrect date of when to show up. So the ATF assembled a grand jury who indicted Weaver, and then they called the U.S. Marshals to round him up. The Marshals surveilled Weaver and his family for 16 months, and they eventually sent some employees up his property clad in camo, night vision goggles, and wielding M16s. At the time, Randy Weaver, his 14-year-old son Sammy, their two dogs, and family friend, 25-year-old Kevin Harris, had been out hunting on the property. One of the Marshall employees threw a rock to gauge the reaction of the dogs. One of them, a yellow lab named Stryker, approached the sound and the Marshall shot and killed the dog. Sammy, who only knew that trespassers were on the property, fired twice as he ran back up the mountain. Marshall employee Deegan then fatally shot Sammy in the back. Kevin Harris turned and fired one shot from the hip, hitting Deegan in the chest and killing him. The Marshals then called their friends and before long, over 400 other folks wearing badges were present on the scene. They erected roadblocks and checkpoints to prevent area residents and friends of the Weavers from getting anywhere close to them and to disallow the Weavers from getting any real aid. Though negotiations were supposedly in the plans, Dick Rogers, the head of the FBI's hostage rescue team present on the scene, told his snipers to essentially shoot on sight. A short time later, when Randy Weaver went to the shed to visit his now deceased son, FBI employee Lou Harici fired. The bullet entered Randy's shoulder and exited his armpit. Randy ran back to the cabin. Randy's wife, Vicki, was standing in the doorway. She was holding their 10-month-old baby. She posed no threat. Yet Harici fired a second shot and hit Vicki in the face, killing her. The bullet exited Vicki's skull, and it, and her skull fragments, hit Kevin Harris, who'd been nearby, puncturing his lung and causing other injuries. After 12 days of negotiations led by Bo Gritz, Randy Weaver, his surviving family, and friend Kevin Harris left the property. Without question, the incident at Ruby Ridge resonated with many. The gross unaccountability and the unnecessary violence stained the perception many folks had of federal police employees. It was in that context that those at the ATF sought to improve their standing, always seen as being second tier to the FBI. They set their sights on a group of people just northeast of Waco, Texas. One way the Davidians supported themselves was by buying firearms and later selling them at gun shows. This drew the attention of ATF employees, and though the Davidians had invited the ATF employees to check the legality of their firearms, the ATF chose not to, believing this high-profile raid would be best for their image. They thought they'd just easily roll onto the property of the branch Davidians, parade them all out in handcuffs, and levy firearms charges against them. But that's not what happened. On February 28, 1993, two trucks pulling cattle trailers rolled onto the Davidian property, out of which 75 ATF employees emerged. One of the employees fired around through the Davidian's metal front door, resulting in a firefight. Before too long, 10 people in total had been killed. Just like at Ruby Ridge, lots of their friends with badges were called in. FBI employees got military hardware, including M1 Abrams tanks, by claiming a drug war nexus which circumvented the Posse Comitatus law which said that no military hardware could be used in the USSA. A siege ensued, and the Davidians were purposefully cut off from their community. In the nighttime, FBI employees and their colleagues would shine spotlights in the D Davidians' windows. They blasted through speakers the sounds of jets and animals being slaughtered. Supporters and reporters were kept over a mile away. The Davidians, in an attempt to share what was going on, wrote messages on bed sheets and hung them from the windows. At one point, FBI employees provided the Davidians with a video camera. They told the Davidians to record their testimonies, to share what was going on, and that they would then make that public. However, once the FBI was given the video camera back with all the recordings, they decided to not sh share that, to not make it public, because they felt that it would allow people to sympathize with the Davidians. Eventually, 51 days after the ATF employees had started the firefight, FBI employees and their colleagues 
started ramming heavy machinery and tanks into the Davidian structure and inserting CS gas, all the while an Orwellian recording that stated, this is not an attack, was playing. Soon after, due to the presence of the high Texas winds and the chemicals of the CS gas, a fire started. The property was engulfed almost immediately, yet, just like the reporters and the members of the public, the fire trucks were kept at the checkpoint over a mile away. In total, 76 Davidians were killed, including 20 children. And when the FBI turned the scene over to the Texas Rangers for forensics, they had already removed over 9,000 cubic feet of dirt, including shell casings, CS rounds, uh, and even the metal front door from the property. Bundy Ranch was a bit different. Though, like Ruby Ridge and Waco, hundreds of badged folks were present, they weren't able to have their way and then cover their tracks. The reason? There were hundreds of supporters on the property, many who filmed and some who were armed. Just like Ruby Ridge and Waco, there are a lot of background details involved with this incident, so I encourage you to learn more about them, but essentially it comes down to a land grab. One man, Clive and Bundy, a rancher and father of 14, refused to fall in line. Bundy's family had been raising cattle in the area since 1877. In 1954, the Bureau of Land Management, or BLM, told Bundy and other ranchers that they needed to sign an annual permit to use land for foraging and water rights. In exchange for the permit fee, the BLM claimed that it would help to improve the property by doing things like erect fences. For years, Bundy had signed the BLM permit and paid the fee, but in 1993, after the BLM changed the fine print on what they could do, giving themselves more authority, Bundy refused to sign. Many ranchers saw this change as the BLM actively trying to squeeze them out to obtain the land. The BLM employees then turned to their friends in legal land who ruled against Bundy and at one point said that he owed the BLM $200 per day per head of cattle that was on the land. On April 5th, 2014, hundreds of federal employees, contract cowboys, and airplanes and helicopters descended on Bundy's land. But word got out. Bundy had a blog on which those interested could sign up to be on his action list and receive notifications if and when their assistance was needed. Soon neighbors and folks who had known Bundy and his family for their lifetime were demanding answers and asking questions. And soon after that, supporters who had never met Bundy but who knew of the incident arrived on the scene. Though there were a couple of tense moments early on, 57-year-old Margaret Houston, a cancer survivor, had been pushed down by a BLM employee, and one of Clive and Bundy's sons had been kidnapped and caged for the night. Eventually, the situation was brought to a conclusion, at least very visible threats made by BLM employees with firearms, when after telling the growing crowd that you need to leave the area, the crowd did not, and in fact, they advanced upon the BLM. As one reporter present noted, they were peaceful yet determined. Bundy, a religious man at one point, stated, I don't stand alone. I have all of the prayers from lots of people around the world, and I feel those prayers, and those prayers take the tremble out of my legs, and I can stand strong and straight. To put it another way, we're safer when we have each other's back. It's not surprising that those who seek to control us try to keep us divided. Perhaps nothing that is more powerful than our unity and together confronting bullies, no matter their attire. Yeah.